when I heard from Brother Arunji, I was so excited about coming and being part of the Southwest Brethren Conference again. I believe if I got my count right, this is our third visit together like this, and there's nothing like a conference time, is it? It encourages our hearts as we just meet together, so I want to thank you for the kind invitation that you've given to me. I'd also like to just thank the Lord for the good start we've had to our conference already. Brother Saji Varghese and his ministry on the first two verses of the book of Jude. What a blessing it was, and as our brother even mentioned it in his prayer, how the Lord is working in us to prepare us for that great day when we'll actually see him and be presented to him in all of his glory, not our own. I'm also so glad that Brother Nathan Bramson's here. Glad you're here, brother. And also, uh, just, to, just to have some time together. Nathan and I go way back. We go so far back, he can't even remember. <laughs> In fact, uh, we got to know Paul and Carol, his parents, through our work in Africa back in the early 1980s. And then when I was home on furlough from Africa, Nathan was one of the counselors at summer camp at Camp Hope. And we saw many young children come to know the Lord that week. And I came home and I told Nancy, I said, there's a young man there that God has his hand on. And it's been true, hasn't it? The Lord's used Nathan in a great way in your life and in my life. And uh, while Nathan was at school at Winthrop University in South Carolina, he was enjoying, and we enjoyed his fellowship together at Believer's Bible Chapel there in Charlotte where we were at. Nathan and I went out on uh, neighborhood evangelism. And we showed up, just the two of us. And so, you know, you're supposed to go two by two, but if you go two by two, you only get to a certain number of doors. So we said, let's go two by two. You get on that side of the road, I'll get on this side of the road. And I could hear Nathan on my side. I think he could hear me on his side. And we kept up with each other as we went two by two, door by door. So we just thank the Lord for those times together. I think the best is still yet ahead. Amen. And we trust that the Lord will make good opportunities that we could do exploits for him. Many of you have asked me about my wife, Nancy. She sends her greetings. She's following the scripture, you know. Keep her at home. And I'm sorry she's not here with me. She sends her greetings and would love to have been here. It's hard to know exactly what to do with schedules and all these things, but thank you for asking and inquiring. We'll tell you a little bit more about her as we get along during our time together. Before I read, I just want to remind you at a conference, I like to remind you, Every time we have a conference like this together, that the most important times of the conference is not when somebody's preaching at you. It's when you have those in-between times. The times of fellowship, one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm already being blessed by the things that you're sharing with me and the things that we get to impart one to another. Paul said that we may be encouraged by each other by the mutual faith that we have. And so as we talk about contending for the faith, Let's share the things that God has shown us over the years that would be the help that each one of us need and those times in between meeting and eating just when we're sitting down together and enjoying good Christian fellowship together. Now, in the Word of God, in the book of Jude, you know, you could read one book in a night, can't you? Especially if it only has one chapter. In the book of Jude, we're just going to look at two verses this evening. Verses 3 and 4, as our brother Sajif has already gotten us a good start in the first two verses, I'll read, I'm using the New King James Translation, and we are looking at the present danger of false teachers, and so Jude chapter 1, verse 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you, to contend earnestly for the faith which was, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness or licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we trust that God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Yeah. As we begin looking at the present danger of false teachers, as Jude warns us in this day and time, he starts out, I'll just let you know exactly where we're going. That's the, that's the way any tour leader would 
leave his tour. He would tell you where we're going, and when we get there, he'll tell you where we are, and when we get done, he'll tell you where we've been. And so I'm going to tell you where we're going to begin with. We're going to look at three things in these two verses. We're going to look at the desire that Jude had to write this letter and what his original desire and purpose was. Secondly, we're going to talk about the duty that overwhelmed him that he had to warn us about. And he took that duty very seriously. And he set aside his first desire in order to fulfill the duty that he was bound by the Lord to write. And then thirdly, he's going to let us know some dangers to watch out for. And so we're going to start with the very first one and just talk about his desire to write to begin with. And he starts with that wonderful term of endearment, beloved. Don't you like that? You know, he's not just saying that we were loved or that we will be loved, but right now and forever we are being loved by our Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. He proved that love like no one else could prove it. He laid down his life for us. He said, I love you this much. And his arms were nailed open so that we would know that love never changes. We are being loved. That's why we're called beloved. The beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what he calls us, the wonderful privileged position we have as the bride of Christ. That's what I call my bride, my beloved. And that's what he calls us, beloved. Not only in verse 3, but actually in verse 1, when it says those who are called, this word sanctified, actually is translated in some translations as beloved. I like it, don't you? I have a dear friend, Arne Lindhardson. He was a missionary in Zaire when we were serving there. And he had a Land Cruiser Toyota. And everybody wanted to use his Land Cruiser. And in his Norwegian accent, he would tell us, No, the Land Cruiser is just like my wife. For me and me alone. And that's what the beloved means. We've been set apart, not just from this world, we've been set apart unto our God who loved us with an everlasting love and underneath him laid the everlasting arms. He's holding us in his love. We are being loved. We're the beloved. Not only in verse 1 and also in verse 3, also in verse 17, but you, beloved, remember. And then in verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up as we heard earlier in our most holy faith. I'm glad I'm loved by the greatest lover in all the universe. There's none like him, and his love far exceeds any love in this world. So he starts with that term of endearment, and he calls us his beloved. Now he describes in verse 3, after opening that great verse was beloved, he says, while I was very diligent, is the way the New King James translated, technically it should be while I was so earnestly eager to write to you, he speaks of his earnest desire with eagerness to write, and he wanted to write, well, you know, Jude, by the way, Judah, it means praise. And so he wanted to write a happy, praiseful letter all about our common salvation. Now, wait just a minute, you say, what? How common is the salvation? Well, it's not quite like the common cold. Or it's not like Simon Peter who said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. But this common, you're going to like this. This common is speaking about what only believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have a share in. You know, not very far from here, one year ago, on June the 1st, 2018, at McKinney, Texas, or from McKinney, Texas, and held in Maryland, there was a young man, his name was Karthik Namani, and he won the spelling bee, the Scripps National Spelling Bee. Anybody know about this? You mean I come from North Carolina and I know about this? And it just happened a few miles up the road that Karthik came from McKinney? Maybe, maybe somebody's family knows Karthik uh, themselves? 
Well, he was given a word in the spelling bee with 500 contestants, and the word was koinonia. Some of you are nodding. You nod too many times, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> koinonia. And he asked, would you give me the definition on koinonia? And he's only 14 years old. And when they gave him the definition that it meant Christian fellowship, they said a great big smile came on his face because he knew the word. I hope you know the word. It's found 19 times in our New Testament. I've even, I've even seen it on the back of a boat down in Manawarki in the Bahamas. Koinonia. It's all about fellowship. I translated it into Swahili for a visitor one time whose book on fellowship. He said, you know, some people say fellowship is, and I said in Swahili, Wadimangini and I waited for him to drop the other shoe, and he said, three fellows in a ship. That doesn't translate into Swahili at all. In fact, when I translate, him across as three men in a boat. <laughs> what is fellowship? Well, fellowship is what we enjoy, one with another, sharing all things in common. When one has a heartache, we all hurt together. When one rejoices, we all rejoice together. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. And we have that wonderful bond in Christ. Well, that's what this word common really comes from. The idea is koinos, from the same basic root word as koinonia, it's not describing just the fellowship, but it's actually that bond that holds us together. Now, what really binds us together here from all these different places where we come, that a boy from North Carolina and a boy from South Carolina and, and all of you right here, what keeps us together? Look at the variety around us. You can't make this happen politically, can you? I'll tell you, the only bond that really holds us together is Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there is that one body that we enjoy. And what is it all about? Well, it's what we have in common. The only one we truly have in common is Christ. And he is the common one that holds us together. That's so much better than just, uh, well, just getting on all these other side issues. When it comes to seeing what really binds believers together, go right to the very heart of the, of the purpose that we have in common. And it's always Christ. When you get off onto other things, that's where the divisions happen. But we share Christ in common. I wanted to write, he says, with great eagerness and earnestness, a desire I had was to write to you, Judah meaning praise, something that is praiseful. I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. But there was something that drove him on to say, no, I've got to write to you about something else. And he introduces to us in verse 3 that he found something that was more necessary. It was necessary, he said, to write to you, and it was a duty he took from the Lord to warn us about something that was going on. Now, he's writing to believers, but he's writing about unbelievers. Not just unbelievers, but he's writing about false teachers. And so this duty, he says, it's going to come to you, this warning, in written form. I am so glad he wrote it down, aren't you? We have it right here in our Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. These things are written for our learning, that through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And as he writes to us, it was kept, it was circulated, and we hold in our hands the written word of God. And part of it is this book of Jude that Jude included in this letter. I'm glad he wrote it down. You know, there are a lot of good intentions, aren't there? That people have a lot of good thoughts. But write it down. And when Jude wrote a letter, God said, that belongs in my Bible. And he gave us his blessed word. 
and it's written right there for us in black and white. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, I want to buy a new Bible. What kind should I get? I said, well, you can get any kind you want to, just make sure it's red. They said, oh, you mean the color means something? No, not the color. Make sure it's red. You know, it's not just that we have a Bible like a relic that sits on the table. We have a Bible that we read. And in the reading of the Bible, isn't that what Simon Peter asked on behalf of the disciples? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and they're written in the Word of God. We can read it. And it's just as fresh, though it's the eternal Word of God, it's just as fresh as the very first time it was written. For the express purpose, he says, I wanted to write to you. Not only to write to you, but he said, I wanted to exhort you. That means to, well, I see the translation here means urge. It's even stronger than that. I wanted to encourage with strong persuasion. Now, you know, we all respond differently to encouragement. Some people need the encouragement like, you can do it, you can do it. Other people need the encouragement like, you go do that. Oh, whatever you respond to, take it from the Lord. Because Jude says, I wanted to write to you. And I was duty bound to write this warning. So I'm writing it down. And I want to encourage you, whether you need a simple prod or whether you need a stiff reminder. He says, I wanted to exhort you. And then he says, to contend for the faith. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But did you notice we've got three things that he just mentioned here? Jude has a nice pattern in his writings. And that is, he likes triplets. You know what doubles are, you know, or singles, but he goes with triplets. In fact, up in verse 1, when he writes, his first triplet concerned his readership, those that he referred to as being the called, the sanctified, and the preserved in Christ Jesus. Now that's a triple hold, isn't it? By the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every fact be confirmed. He likes the triplets, those who are called, those who are sanctified, and those who are preserved in Christ Jesus. Someone asked me about the perseverance of the saints. Do you believe in it, they asked? I said, I'd rather believe in the preservation of the saints. We are kept by the power of God, and nothing can ever break that hold. I like the triplets. Not only in verse 1, but also in verse 2. There's another triplet. He said, mercy, peace, and love being multiplied to you. Now, if you're already up to three and you're going to multiply, that's using higher math, right? That's a heavenly mathematics. Multiply them out, but all starting with the triplet, those three things, mercy, peace, and love. So when we come to verse three, we're not surprised at all. In the third verse, there's another triplet to write, to exhort, and to contend for the faith. Would you notice, please, when it comes to contending, that it's a word that actually means to agonize. It's the only place it appears in the New Testament. Epigonizomai is what they say it's pronounced as in Greek. You know, the pronunciation of the Greek is not only wrong whenever I try it, but it has no value at all. But I can tell you what it means. It means to agonize and really strive for the faith. What does that mean? Only to the point that we have been changed and made different can we ever make a difference in our world. Only to the point that the gospel has impacted us can we ever make an impact in our world. Only to the point that we get to where we agonize for the faith will we ever be used in a mighty way for God. But if we become lackadaisical and sitting and resting, as someone said, you know, God comforts the afflicted, but he afflicts the comfortable. <laughs> it might be that's what we need. Something to stir us up and to say, we've been called to agonize for the sake or for the faith and what's contained in it. 
So what is its meaning? Well, if you don't mind a, a homespun, simple example, when we were down in the Bahamas suffering for the Lord one year, it's always a hard to ask for prayer if you're going to the Bahamas in February. But when we were down suffering for the Lord one year in the Bahamas, some of the saints took us out in their boat and they dove up these nice big conch shells with an animal in there we could eat fresh. Some people say eat raw. I like to say I eat it fresh. <laughs> and it's good. If you've been in Africa, conch, eating conch is nothing. Huh? We enjoyed fried grasshoppers and stuff like that in Africa, so give me a conch any day. And they would dive up a conch sometimes 20, 30 feet of water. They'd, they'd just dive right down there. You could see them through that beautiful Caribbean water, just as clear as it could be. And they'd pick up the conch so easily. And they'd come up with three or four or five conch in their hands, and we'd, we'd enjoy them. And I saw a conch down in the water, and I asked, could I try to dive that conch up? And they said, sure. And so there it was right down below me, I jumped overboard, and the tide moved me, and I missed it by about five feet. Came back up, and I said, oh, I don't know what happened. They said, it's the tide, Brother Rex. He said, you've got to start over there, and it'll bring you right to it. So I, I said, well, can I try it again? I'm just trying this out, you know. And they said, sure, and I, I dove in there, and I missed it by about a foot. I couldn't believe it. I was embarrassed. I said, give me just one more try. Now, I, want to, I want you to follow this now because now we're talking about agonizing. Huh? I said, one more try. I said, all right, we'll swing back around. And there it was. And I, I jumped out of the boat, went down in the water. Listen, I missed it again, but I started swimming against the tide. I decided I was running out of air. I decided I was going to drown before I missed that call. And I got it. And I came back up so happy. It was the ecstasy of agony. And I said, how deep was the water where I was diving? I said, about six or seven feet. <laughs> so much for my agony. But I want to tell you, to me it meant going for it no matter what the cost is, when it comes to contending for the faith, that's what we're talking about. It's not fighting against the world, but it's, it's holding forth, no matter what it costs, for the faith. And that's exactly what Jude is writing. He says, I wrote to you to contend for the faith, and look how he describes it. He said, also in verse 3, which was once and that's a final one and only time. Not only once, but the New King James says once for all. Now once is a numeric word. So numerically speaking, one time and only one. For all is a word that's conclusive, including all. So it's a once for all deliverance of the faith to the saints. What is this faith that he's speaking about? Well, the faith is that once for all body of truth that has been delivered to the believers, consisting of all that we believe as Christians, those who are saved. Peter, the Apostle Paul as well, they spoke about the truth or the faith. Even Luke, as he begins his gospel in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he said, I am setting forth in an orderly fashion a declaration of those things, that's speaking about the truth or the faith, those things which are most surely believed among us. And he delivered it once for all. So how do we contend for the faith? Let me have you turn to a verse in the Bible. It's a great verse. It's in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. I said, contending for the faith is not fighting against the enemy. We're to resist the enemy and he'll flee from us. Our fight is not with flesh and blood, with carnal or fleshly weapons of warfare. But the fight that we're involved in 
is for bringing down strongholds and every high and lofty thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. And how do we do it? Well, here's how we do it. We take the truth, the embodiment of what we refer to as the faith, and we guard it. We agonize with it. We strive to make sure that in its entirety, once for all, it's delivered unto the saints from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And that's why I had to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul writes and he says, And the things, that's the truths of the faith, that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Did you catch those three generations there? Talk about another triplet. He says, you've heard them from me, that's the first generation. I've given them to you, that's the next generation. I want you to commit them to faithful men who will be able to teach others as well. That's the third generation. Three generations right there. But you can only pass it on from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Someone said the church is always one generation short of extinction. If our generation misses the importance of passing on the faith, what will our children do? It's an awesome responsibility, isn't it? And you can remember that scripture reference very easily. What was it? Second Timothy, there's two. Just like Paul to Timothy. Chapter two, that's Timothy to faithful men. Verse two, you remember two, 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 right? Uh, that's the, those faithful men are gonna be teaching others also. And so you're number one. Where did you get the truth from? And probably from hearing it from your parents are hearing it faithfully presented in meetings just like this in conference time. The teaching of the Word of God, the precious truths, the faith that is given to us to maintain, to guard, to strive, or to contend for. What are you going to do with it? That's his exhortation. Pass it on. Keep on delivering it to the next generation, to the saints. So what is the faith? Well, the things that we surely believe among us. Let me just name a few. In fact, I think that every believer, not just assemblies of believers, but every believer needs to know what his statement of faith is. Now, I'm not saying just write it down, but if that helps you, that's a good way to start. Write it down. You can write it down right now. I have two memories, by the way. One is very short, the other is written down. I like the written memory the best, don't you? We'll start with the inspiration of the scriptures. We have a living, God-breathed Bible, the Word of God. It came from Him personally. And it is the inspired Word of God. That's the first thing. That's the whole basis and foundation of our faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want to know what you believe? Look at the Bible. And when we have the Bible before us, we know that's the first thing. We believe the Bible, the Word of God. Not only do we believe the Bible, we believe what the Bible teaches about God. That God exists in three persons, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three equal and yet working in different roles. We don't have to understand it to appreciate it. We know that God the Father sent God the Son. And God the Son, when he finished the work, he went back to the Father's right hand and he sent the Spirit to continue in the work. One friend of mine used to say, the Father brought it, the Son brought it, the Spirit hath brought it in our hearts and he's working in this world to convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. And he's continuing on in that work. We believe in the Godhead or the Trinity. We believe in the deity of Christ. That he is very God of very God, yet by the incarnation, God became man. And great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest, revealed in the flesh. We believe in the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus. His burial, his resurrection from the dead on the third day, and his ascension back into heaven. We believe in the gospel. 
that Paul writes, this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel and that he appeared alive and alive forevermore. We believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming personally to take the church out of this world. We call it the rapture. I know there are some different views on when he's coming. I won't even go there. Just tell me you believe he's coming. That's, you know, if you ever wanted to say amen at a meeting, that would have been a great place. <laughs> he's coming again. And we know he is. And we can hardly wait. And not only that, we believe that we'll enjoy eternal bliss with him forever and ever and ever. But the sad part is, while we're with him 10,000 years bright, shining as the sun, we know less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The other side of eternity, those who reject the Savior, they go on forever and ever too in eternal punishment. We believe it. We don't like it. We believe it because that's what the Bible teaches and is part of the faith that we contend for. When people cast down on what we believe, you go right back to the solid foundation of God. It's been tested, it's been tried, and it's proven, and it's settled forever in heaven. These things that I've just mentioned are non-negotiable. We wouldn't give an inch. We want to be steadfast, immovable, Someone said trying to get a believer who believes the word of God to change would be like trying to bend the stump. It just can't be done. It's not up for discussion. And the only way that we can contend for the faith is to know what the word of God says. That's our very source. I didn't say contend for traditions. Sometimes people get a little confused. There's a little bit of Pharisee in all of us. We all have a traditional bent on us. But keep it clear and stand solidly on the faith that's been once delivered to all the saints. Best way to know whenever a counterfeit shows, you know, because Jude, he doesn't mention a particular group of people here when he talks about false teachers. He doesn't tell us the name of the cult or the movement because these things are always changing names, but he identifies them by what they do. We'll talk about that in the morning. And that's so much better than giving us a name because the names change. Definitions move. But if we know what we believe, we'll be ready. And this truth, knowing the truth, will help us spot a counterfeit without any problem whatsoever. We need not fear if we know the book. I was at a conference just like this, a number of years ago, and some very kind, generous saints, when they greeted me, they put a, I'm not, this is not a suggestion, this is just a story, but they put a $20 bill in my hand, and another did, and another did, and I got back home, and well, I took the 20 to the bank, and I was making a deposit, and the teller, I knew her personally, she counted, and she laid the third one aside, and finished, how many times I get that? No, okay. Uh, put the third one aside. I said, what's that one? She said, counterfeit. I said, really? I can hardly wait to use that as a sermon illustration. I've never seen a counterfeit bill. And she said, you're not going to use that one. She picked up that $20 counterfeit bill. She put it in an envelope, sealed it, stuck it in the drawer with just a little slot. She said, nobody's getting that. Just the, the SPI, the State Bureau of Investigation. I said, what about my point? She said, it's gone. <laughs> and I said, i got to ask you, just for the sake of a sermon illustration or a children's illustration, I said, how did you know it was counterfeit? I mean, she was just going through, just like that. I said, how did you know it so fast? I said, have you studied counterfeit bill? She said, no. She said, I handle the real thing all the time. And when I felt the counterfeit, I knew it. I said, you just ruined my illustration. <laughs> I don't want to go by feelings. I want to go by knowledge. These things we know. Because God has written it in his word. No, we're not going to go by feelings. In a spiritual realm, feelings can mislead you and you'll be following account of it in the moment. You can say, when he spoke, I could just feel it. 
You just leave those feelings aside. You go by what you know is in the Word of God. Be like the noble Bereans. Search the Scriptures to know that these things are true. And you know, if you know the Word of God, you can spot a phony a mile away. The counterfeit is there. There's a lot to say about the faith. You go by the Word of God. It's been given to us by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We have it right there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Not only 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I love the 316s of the Bible, don't you? I like 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Great is the mystery of God, and as God revealed in flesh. And he goes through the things that are set forth there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that he was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. That's six things in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And I added one more. He's coming again. I like the 316s of the Bible. In fact, when I checked in this afternoon, they said, your room's on the third floor. I got excited. <laughs> and I looked at my key. It's 3-1, 3 one, three, one four. <laughs> I can't believe it. I went to Walmart the other day, and I bought some snacks on my way to a conference. I wanted to witness to the lady at the cashier, at the cashier at the checkout, and I have this special gift. Whenever I get in line at the grocery store, the line stops. It's my spiritual gift. And when it stops, I get to talk with people in front of me and behind me about the gospel. And no one was interested. So the line moved up, and there was the cashier. I thought, well, I've got a gospel track. I'll leave her a gospel track. When I looked at her, she didn't look like she'd be interested, but you can't go by the outside of the cover, huh? Because, you know, God works in the heart, doesn't he? Not with the outward appearance. But she looked very much like the world. My total came to $16.84. She punched in all the buttons, and bright green numbers came up on the cashier's register. And the change, 316. There I was trying to witness to someone, and no one wanted to listen. And she said, 316 is your change. I said, 316? I said, you know what that makes me think of? And the lady down way back in the line, she says, makes me think about John 316. And the cashier said, oh yeah, that's the one that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I looked at her, I said, do you know that verse? She didn't look like she would know that verse. She said, I just got saved two months ago. Amen. You know, just because he's working on the heart doesn't mean the outside changes overnight. And she said, I just got saved two months ago. I tell you what, I like 316s, don't you? You get there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and you find out what the Word of God is all about. It is profitable for us. We need every bit of it to know what we need to know from the Word of God. It's inspired of God. It's inspired verbally that every word means something. It's inspired as a plenary word that overall the word of God has given to us. We need all the word of God all the time. Not only that, but the word of God, we believe not only in its inspiration, we believe it's inerrant. It has no errors whatsoever. We believe it's instructive. It teaches us everything we need to know about God and about us. And about his work in our lives and in this world, we believe it's interpretive. In other words, the Bible tells you what it means. If you're not sure what a verse means, don't stop reading. Just read the rest of it. It'll open up to you. The best way to read your Bible is on your knees praying, open down my eyes that I might behold wondrous things from your word. The best way to pray is with your Bible open, claiming the promises of God. It's also impacting. It will impact our life. Are you reading the Bible? If you're not reading the Bible every day, I don't mean like a checklist 
of Pharisees. <laughs> if you're not reading the Bible every day and dwelling on the Word of God, you're not contending for the faith. Put a little sweat equity into it. Huh? Read it. Nancy and I read the Bible in the morning. It's the greatest time of our day. And we have problems. Sometimes even when we're reading, that's when Satan likes to attack. If we're running late reading our Bible, we're in such a habit of reading the Bible together and praying together that our little dog, she's our resident Pharisee, if we're running late, she goes into the living room, gets on the footstool and starts barking, you need to come read your Bible. It should be so much a part of our routine. It's all part of agonizing, striving, contending for the faith. You need to take it seriously. Thirdly, not only does he have a desire to write and a duty to warn, but he has some dangers for us to watch out for. And the danger he mentions, as you'll notice it in verse 4, he warns first of all about certain men. Now he doesn't mean certain like they have no doubt. He means certain men like some men. Thank God there are not many, but there are more than ever before. Certain men, he says, they got in amongst you. They crept in unnoticed. I want to ask a question. How did they creep in unnoticed? Paul warned the elders of Ephesus. He said, I'm warning you to keep this charge because after my departure, the Apostle Paul says, Savage wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Watch, he said. And yet, certain men have crept in unawares. Not only did the Apostle Paul warn this, Simon Peter warned him. He said, there were false prophets among the peoples in the Old Testament. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Very similar to exactly what Jude writes. The book of Galatians says, false brethren, that means unbelievers, they were brought in by people that were believers, unsuspecting. The big question is, where were the shepherds watching? Sometimes we refer to elders as oversight. <laughs> that is an oversight, isn't it? Yeah. They were overlooking instead of overseeing. Watch, that's what Peter says, as a fellow elder. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God. What do we need to do? We need to feed the flock. We need to lead the flock. That's contending for the faith. Preparing us for those who try to creep in unnoticed or unawares. Verse 4 also says, for these certain men that crept in, that they were marked out. It says, long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Marked out? What kind of mark are we talking about? You know, the first mark we have in our Bible was given to Cain. He was marked out, wasn't he? When did he get the mark? Just let me clarify in verse 4 that it's not saying that there were certain men that God marked out long ago saying, these men are going to be the false teachers and they're going to suffer destruction eternally. No, that's not the way it works. The destruction was determined long ago, but not the people. It wasn't that the people were marked out, but the destruction was marked out long ago. That whoever goes contrary and rejects the word of God, their condemnation will be just and sure. Now that was determined long ago. Again, the first mark in the Bible was Cain. When did he get the mark? Was it before he rejected God's offer of salvation or after? 
Cain and Abel brought an offering to the Lord. Abel brought a firstling of the flock, a blood sacrifice. Cain, he brought the fruit of his labor, works. It was man's religion at its worst. And God accepted Abel's offering of blood, and he rejected Cain's. So what did God say? He pled with Cain, and he said, listen, sin lies at the door, but you must master it. Some translations have helped us understand. He's saying, sin is at the door, but there's a sacrifice also at the door that you can take. And Cain was angry. And he went out in the field where Abel was. And he took his brother Abel and he slew him. He cut his throat in his jugular vein as if to say, you want a blood sacrifice? Here's a blood sacrifice. And he rejected God's offer of salvation. And when God was going to drive him out of the garden, or out, not out of the garden, but out from that area, he would wander through the land of Nod. He said, my punishment is too great. And God put a mark on him. What came first? He rejected God's offer of salvation. Then he got the mark. These false teachers have rejected what God has offered. And they've put themselves in the service of trying to lead the people of God astray. We're going to see them again and again in our next session together tomorrow morning. And they were marked out because of the decision they made to reject the Lord. They crept in. And they were marked out. Verse 4 says they were certain men. Verse 4 also says they were ungodly men. What is their doctrine? Well, their doctrine is ungodliness. What does ungodliness mean? Of course, we know the root word of ungodliness is God. And the long word is godliness, to be like him. Ungodliness is to be anything but like him. And that was their doctrine. We want to leave God out of every part of our life. We want him out of the world. We want him out of society. We want him out of every different person's life. We want there to be no God. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And that's what the ungodly men practice as their doctrine. That's their whole life in teaching. In fact, I've kept a little list over the years. They're part of the ungeneration. Ten different words found in our New Testament that start with the letters U-N, un. They were unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, unrighteous, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unmerciful, ungodly, as we just mentioned, and unbelieving. Everything that we as believers enjoy, the ungodly want nothing to do with it. That's their doctrine. It's amazing that they can have such an impact on the world in which we live. But we see it happening all around us, don't we? Don't say anything about the Lord. Don't carry your Bible in public because the ungodly are uncomfortable. <laughs> no. We want to be godly people, don't we? But some have crept in unawares and they're ungodly. They practice it in their doctrine. What do they do? Look at verse 4 again. Not only do they have a doctrine of ungodliness, they're committed to distorting the gospel of God's grace. You see it right there in verse 4. Who turn the grace of our God into lewdness or licentiousness. They're given completely to sensuality. Our society in which we live is so saturated with sexuality and sensuality that even some professing believers are very protect protective of those who are in immorality. And the tide is going against us. And when we stand for the Lord, and we hold on to the faith, there's a tide that's moving against us that we need to be strengthened in our resolve to say, no, the grace of God is given freely to all who believe, but the ungodly take the grace of God and they say, well, if God's grace is so great, you can do anything you want to. That's what I asked the man when I heard the gospel the first time. He said, 
Eternal life is a free gift from God, no strings attached. And I said, you mean I can accept Christ as my Savior and do anything I want to? He said, absolutely. He said, but if you accept Christ as your Savior, he's going to change your walk to work. You won't want to do the things you used to do. The ungodly are not so. They try to twist or distort the simplicity of the gospel of God's grace. You know, if we learn these things, then we can spot a false teacher so easily. Because you and I know the freeness of God's grace. Because coming to the Lord doesn't give us liberty to sin. It gives us freedom to serve, doesn't it? I'm not obligated to the flesh anymore. I've been set free. And now I can serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength, with all my body. Even the body the Lord wants to save us completely, doesn't he? Spirit, soul, and body. Sanctified and set apart for his purposes. But the false teacher says, oh no, all that doesn't really matter. You can do anything you want to. Not only do we see their doctrine of ungodliness and their distortion of God's grace, but here's the ultimate. The denial, as it points out to us at the end of verse 4, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it sounds like he's mentioning two persons of the Godhead here, but that's not the way it should read. They deny the only Lord, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Denying the Lord as the only way to God. Because the ungodly say there are many ways that you can be right. There's only one way, and only one. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Help me out here. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now that's inclusive of all who believe. And it's exclusive of, any, of anyone who doesn't want to accept Christ as their Savior. They deny the only Lord Jesus Christ. Not only denying him as the only way of salvation, they deny his Lordship of their life to say, I'm my own person. No, when we come to Christ, our lives belong to Him. He has the very best plan for us. I just want to mention it. these three things that we just looked at their doctrine of ungodliness, their distortion of God's grace, their denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those three statements right there show us the present danger of false teachers. When words like this are in the Word of God to warn us, we need to realize that we're looking at a clear and present danger. That was a military term that came about in the early 1900s whenever there was a threat to the freedom and society of this country. And Oliver Wendell Holmes is the one who introduced it. When you hear those who are speaking words of subversion against the powers that be, that's when he turned to that clear and present danger. I want to tell you, these three things qualify what's going on in our world today. It's a clear and present danger. What will we do when we don't go out and attack the unbelievers? They're just captive, you know. They're being held by the enemy. We contend for the faith. We hold these truths that have been given to us in the Word of God, and we want to faithfully be passing them on. He turns this into a great watchword. The desire to write, oh, he wanted to write. The duty to warn, he couldn't do anything but exactly what he did and write these things to us. But the danger to watch out for these things we need to get back to the, to the watchwords of the Old Testament prophets, don't we? And of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what he said? And what I say to you, I say to all. Watch. 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 Take heed. We've been called to contend for the faith. Someone has said, well, you can contend without being contentious. 
It's just whitewashing the whole issue, isn't it? You contend without being contentious. I heard of a man who said at their committee meetings now in the church, at the end of the committee meeting, they all like to ask this question. Have I said anything that has made you feel uncomfortable? <laughs> I said, well, that's a long way from Nehemiah, isn't it? And he said, what do you mean from Nehemiah? I said, Nehemiah chapter 13. Here's what Nehemiah chapter 13 did. He says, I contended with them. I pronounced a curse against them. I struck some of them. I pulled out their hair, and I made them swear to me by God. I hope I haven't said anything that's made you uncomfortable. <laughs> We're going to contend. There's a cause that has to be counted. Again, the contention is not to be contending with the world. We know where the world's at. But we need to be standing firm. I was just thinking as I finished the wonderful hymn we used to sing. We need to sing more of the, of the battle songs, don't we? Like this one. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? The second verse says, Must I be carried to the skies on, on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the tide? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? The last verse says, sure, I must fight if I would win. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil. Endure the pain. And that's what it costs to contend for the faith. But we're supported by thy word. Young David came up, and there was his brothers, and they said, Why did you come to see the battle, David? Where's the few sheep you left in the wilderness? There was no battle going on. And David said, Is there not a cause? Let me ask you, when we talk about contending the faith, for the faith, is there not a cause? There are battles for us to fight. There are spiritual battles, and we might be ready and standing, and having done all to stand, to stand therefore, contending for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Shall we pray? Our blessed Father, as we close this time out, we know that there, um, there's much to do, not just here at the conference, but in our lives. Father, supply everything that we need through your precious word and also supply the courage of faith to stand in these, in these last days. Father, we pray for each and every believer and every assembly that's represented during this conference time that we might be strengthened with strength in the inner man that we might be ready when we return to the world in which we live to seek those who are lost, to give ourselves in order to reach them for Christ. And in our own personal lives and our families, help us strengthen fellow believers through your word we pray as we contend together for the faith. But we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.